This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Philip Bobbitt, who is the Weschler Professor of Law at Columbia. His two recent books on national security and international relations are The Shield of Achilles and Terror and Consent. Philip? Welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you. Nice to be here, Harry. How did uh, your first book, uh, uh, in, in the two we're going to discuss, The Shield of Achilles, how did, how did you come by that title? Well, originally I had planned to publish uh, two separate books, two, t a two-volume uh, set, one called State of War, about the development of the state, and one called States of Peace, about uh, the international order. And I went to my editor at, at Knopf, a wonderful man named Ash Green, one of the really deans of American nonfiction. And he uh, was very positive and he said, now look, we're prepared to publish both of these books, just as they are. And they were about, about a thousand pages each. He said, we have no problem with this. He said, uh, but let me ask you, is one of the books more important than the other? And of course, as a, as a writer, I said, certainly not, Ash. <laughs> and he said, well, our experiences with two-volume works is that Americans won't buy the second volume. That because they've paid for the first volume, they think they more or less know what's in the second volume. And sales fall off. He said, if you want to maximize your audience, you need to put it in one volume, which meant cutting it by, you know, an enormous 50 percent or something, 60, 70 percent. Mm. And it also meant having a title that would encompass these two. The poem by W. H. Auden is an, was a great favorite of mine. And I, I thought it would be uh, uh, a, a title I would love. But I didn't think that uh, the publisher would necessarily go for it. So. I tried The Shield of Achilles, uh, and my editors were a little dubious. They thought it would be filed under classics or something. But my other editor, my editor at Penguin, a marvelous man named Stuart Prophet, reached a compromise. He said, and he talked to Ash and they worked this out. They would call it The Shield of Achilles, colon, War, Peace, and the Course of History. Just tell the reader or the buyer what it was about. And with that uh, amendment, they were prepared to accept it, and I was thrilled. And, and the shield of Achilles is a metaphor for the theory you're, you're trying to propose. That's exactly right. The, you, you know the story of the famous shield. Uh, Achilles' mother, Thetis, goes to, to uh, Hephaestus, the, we, the Romans called Vulcan, to make a shield for her son. And the shield is depicted in the Iliad as having not only scenes of battle, but also uh, religious ceremonies, uh, law courts, uh, feasts and festivals. It, it integrates war with the larger culture, and that was one of the themes I wanted to reflect. And, and to do that as an intellectual project really requires one to combine disciplines because uh, the Constitution, uh, the domestic setting is often uh, separated from the international realm. And, and you're trying uh, to bring those two together as the shield does. That's exactly right, Harry. That, that you, 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 you're spot on. For many years, I taught uh, constitutional law at the University of Texas in Austin, which is where I'm from. And uh, from the very early 80s, I taught strategic studies and the history of strategy in Britain. And I kept them completely separate. 
I had separate libraries. I, I published in different journals. They, they were just two sort of parts of my life. But they began to force themselves together, and I resisted that uh, for a long time. And finally, I just let it happen. And, and this is that kind of uh, intersection, just as you say. And, and in the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. book, you are uh, proposing uh, uh, a relationship yes. between constitution and strategy. Help us understand what you're trying to uh, put together. Yes. The birth of the modern state uh, is usually dated to the Renaissance, when these uh, principalities and dukedoms in Italy faced a challenge from France and, and Spain, and they had to radically innovate constitutionally. One element of that challenge was the introduction of mobile artillery, uh, more powerful, much lighter, and more transportable than hitherto was the case. And when these new weapons came into Italy, they changed the strategic landscape. Moats, high stone curtains suddenly were irrelevant. These very rich but very weak cities needed to raise new sources of revenue in greater amounts to build new walls, a lower, further out from the city's center on which they could put their own artillery. They needed to have alliances among them that were less ephemeral than they'd been in the past. They needed to have ambassadors who would go to another court and actually stay and give intelligence and negotiate. They needed a bureaucracy to keep forces in the field for longer periods. They needed larger forces, bigger mercenary armies. And to do that, they needed a state. Now, if you stop the story right there, you'd say, well, in that case, what uh, Philip Bobbitt is saying is that fundamental innovations in the strategic context bring about changes in the constitutional order. And, and I am saying that. But that's a kind of half-truth, because it depends on where the historian steps into the sort of Heracliton stream. I'll give you this example. Before the French Revolution, uh, the French army was an example of a territorial army, a, a territorial state's force. It was uh, um, officered by aristocrats. The forces were highly professional. They were drilled constantly. But after the revolution, that was no longer possible. The officer class had fled and in many cases been uh, imprisoned or executed. In place of these professional armies, French generals had passionate uh, proletarians and peasants who'd never fired a weapon, they'd never worn a uniform, didn't know how to march, but they were in enormous numbers. And so Napoleon and his contemporaries innovated in their tactics and strategy to reflect this change in the constitutional order from the Ancien Regime to the Napoleonic and Revolutionary State. So that's an example of how a fundamental change in the constitutional order brings about a change in strategy and tactics. So I guess my theory is that there isn't a, a linear monocausal relationship between these two, but a kind of self-exciting circuit as, as one changes the other. Mm -hmm. and, and you are, in essence, when, when we talk about the Constitution and we talk about strategy, which is a, a way to, to synthesize the, the, the two domains here, both areas really are about the control of violence in a way. The, domestically, uh, uh, the, the state that emerges controls the uh, domestic violence, and strategy is about how you respond uh, to violence from afar. That's exactly right. You could think of it as a, a membrane where law is the inner face of the membrane, and the state has a monopoly on violence, with, on legitimate violence within the its domain, and strategy is its relationship of, of uh, violence to other states. Or you could think of it as a glove, perhaps, the inside of a glove and the outside of a glove. Either of these metaphors uh, would work because you can't have an inner membrane without an outer membrane. You can't have the exterior of a glove without the place where the hand goes. And it's the inseparability of these, of these two elements that I was urging. 
Mm -hmm. And and your your work, which I recommend to our audience, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, two books, a number of pages to read, but very worthwhile. And uh, you, you really are grappling with the histor history here, and you're you're moving this theory uh, uh, through the ages of, of the modern state, basically, and essentially. You're saying that what you develop in, in the five or six uh, stages that you talk about, uh, a conflict over the definition of the Constitution and of the international order, which leads to what you called an epical war. So it's, it's not just one war, it's a That's series right. of wars over a period, which then results in a conclusion where one notion about strategy and the Constitution uh, wins out, leading to an international settlement. That's exactly right. I say uh, in one of these books that the constitutional order is, is not just made in history, that it's, it's made of history, it's made out of history. That these epical wars, uh, I mentioned the Italian wars, uh, the wars of the Habsburg and the Valois, uh, the Thirty Years' War, the wars of uh, Louis XIV, the Napoleonic Wars, the, the Long War of the 20th century that includes the First World War, the Bolshevik Revolution, the Spanish Civil War, the Second World War, wars in Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War. These are historians' wars. That is, they, they only appear in retrospect. Someone sent me a Spanish cartoon that has a man uh, climbing out of bed in the morning, his wife is still in bed, and he's putting on his trousers and he says, Darling, I'm off to the Thirty Years' War, you know, <laughs> because they are retrospective, and, and, and the idea of an epical war is, is that a, a war that begins for whatever ordinary reason, uh, some resource, or territorial, or ideological, or religious, or fear, greed, at some point implicates the constitutional order itself, that its legitimacy is challenged. And that kind of a war will not stop until the order has either been validated or overturned by a more strategically dynamic order. And when that happens, then the entire national order changes as other states begin to mimic the successful state. And uh, let's take one example, which is really the, the uh, 20th century. And what, what you're telling us is that sure, we can look at the Vietnam War, the Korean War, World War II, but, but the, the, the way to see the whole picture is to look at the whole century and the, what, what is really an epic of wars which conclude with the collapse of, of uh, the Soviet Union uh, uh, at the uh, in, right. in 1989, but but what, what what was what were these coalitions fighting about throughout the century? Yeah, we began the uh, 20th century with most great powers still being imperial state nations, the constitutional order that begins with uh, Hamilton and Madison and Washington in this country. Uh, an imperial order that begins in, uh, in, on the continent of Napoleon. And that was still the principal constitutional order. There were challenges. The United States in the uh, late 1860s and Germany in the 1870s had begun to innovate constitutionally around an industrial nation state. But it was very much the, uh, the outlier and the challenger. What became the long war of the 20th century was about the constitutional valence of that new order. Would the industrial nation state be a fascist state, a communist state, or a parliamentary state? And until that question was answered, these wars would not cease. They would keep, keep popping up. I, I so, sometimes compare it to those uh, uh, candles at children's birthday parties that you blow out and they pop back in, into fire. The fascist state had to be discredited, not just defeated. It had to be discredited in the eyes of the peoples that had promoted it. And 
I think uh, this happened uh, as a consequence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. And I think it happened because of the death camps in Europe. When people saw the outcome of fascism, this just as much as Normandy or uh, Stalingrad or the defeat of Berlin, this made fascism so odious that now it's, uh, it's almost irrelevant. It's, uh, and it's important to just add that this is about legitimacy absolutely. of these different orders. That's yeah. exactly right. The, the, the touchstone for legitimacy is success, but success by itself is insufficient. The same thing happened with, with communism in the Soviet Union. It, it wasn't enough to simply contain communism. It had to be contained so that it would discredit itself. It would become anaerobic, uh, gradually sort of running out of oxygen before its own people. There was a very moving statement by uh, Boris Yeltsin in which he said, uh, our people were the subject of a grotesque experiment. Well, the experiment had to run its course and then its results had to be repudiated by, by the, its, its people. I'm curious about the creative process in writing this book. So uh, you're watching these events of, of the, the late 1980s and the early uh, 1990s, and, and so you're, you're witnessing the conclusion of, of yes. this uh, yeah. epoch. Uh, is that together with this background in strategic studies and law that led to the fermentation uh, 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 of ideas here? That's right. I, I'd gone to the State Department in 1990, and so I was there just as all these uh, events in, uh, in Europe uh, were happening. The Copenhagen Declaration, the uh, Declaration of Moscow, the Charter of Paris, and uh, although I had always taught constitutional law in government, I had never really practiced as a, as a lawyer. I'd been more interested in uh, intelligence and security issues. So everything sort of came together then, this, this uh, historical cataclysm, as well as my uh, work in uh, constitutional law and my interest in the history of strategy. Now, uh, uh, another element of your theory, uh, uh, and the example you were using earlier about uh, the, the, uh, uh, some of the earlier historic uh, epics, uh, really apply here, namely that in the waging of the conflict, uh, uh, cultural, technological, and other uh, actions set in motion processes that contribute to the undermining of the system. So in, in, the, in, in the case of uh, uh, the 20th century, the communism was not defeated uh, in war, but rather as a result of processes that had been set in motion that, that really changed the world and made both their domestic constitution uh, and their international strategy not feasible. Not anymore. viable, that's right. But it's also true, Harry, about the constitutional order itself. Each new order that triumphs uh, and is then uh, ratified by these great peace conferences, conferences that I analogize to constitutional conventions. Each new order has within it the uh, elements of its own failure. So, for example, the democracies won the long war through the use of uh, nuclear weapons and development of weapons of mass destruction, through global communications that embarrassed uh, the Soviets and uh, discredited the fascist through a global system of trade and finance. Some people believe, and I may be one of them, that our biggest contribution to the defeat of communism in the second half of the 20th century was the maintenance of a fairly stable dollar and a fairly open trading system. Adherence to the rule of law, uh, these, these very factors that brought us triumph will all now undermine that triumph. Weapons of mass destruction will be acquired by non-state actors. A global system of trade and finance will make our financial system much more sensitive to uh, 
uh, very distant and in some cases almost insignificant uh, actors, possible to predict. A system of uh, human rights law will drive some states towards uh, despotism and, uh, and the acquisition of terrible weapons and terrible treatment of their own, their own civilian populations. These, the, the very things that brought us to this great height will present new challenges to us. Mm -hmm. And and importantly, your your before we talk about what you see as emerging as an ideal type, as a result of of, of these these global changes, you you still have a place for uh, uh, human decisions. I mean I mean it's not as if this is some some process that humans don't control. Because I think, importantly, what you're saying is that there are choices that these situations present, and, and, and we have to think through the choices we make, and those choices affect the future. So it's not as if, uh, by uh, having DARPA and inventing the computer, then, then there's an automaticity to, to what the outcome is. That's right. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in a period when uh, individual, uh, the, the role of the individual was, was being discredited because it was clear that enormous forces uh, constrained our, our choices and uh, we were buffeted by uh, long historical waves. And there's a lot to that. Uh, but because our choices are constrained, doesn't mean they aren't decisive. In, in fact, it may be just the other way around, because they are so tightly constrained, when the individual choice turns one way or the other, it will have a, a much greater impact because subsequent choices will be subsequently constrained. I think that the role of the individual conscience is still the decisive factor in human affairs. Uh, actually, that, that's uh, an interesting point because one, one of the issues we then confront as we're caught between two worlds, basically. How does the individual leader make choices? How does the individual citizen know what's, what's good or bad? Because what, what you're uh, describing in your book, and, and the book was published when? In 2002 or? The Shield of Achilles was 2002, that's right. Right. Yeah. The, the, what what you're, you're identifying is a number of problems and issues that now all we have to do is go to the evening news, and th there's a, a different uh, sort of uh, uh, play on this. So, so uh, uh, what are what are the ethical dilemmas of the, of the citizen as they're caught between these two worlds? Well, they're enormous. They're enormous because we have depended uh, throughout the 20th century on state structures uh, to to tame the market and its, uh, its excesses uh, and its cruelty, to support uh, our values, uh, values of uh, loyalty, uh, admiration for political competence, of the respect for the family. We expect states to reinforce uh, those values. Now we're moving into a period when the state will, will not do that. And we can either develop civil institutions to take up where the state is vacated, or we can watch these, these values erode because at the end of the day, we really don't care that much about them. We prefer to be richer and, and freer. Uh, the exercise of your values can be very constraining. Now help us understand what the ideal type uh, emerging in the context of this this passing of the nation state, because all of these processes that you just talked about really are are undermining uh, the 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 capacity of the state to implement the goal that w was was at the core of the nation state. That's right. What uh, and you call the new uh, state the market state. What is the, the goal of the market state and how does it differ from the goal of the nation state? Nation states, and by that I mean 20th century industrial nation states, well, one of the purposes 
behind riding the shield of Achilles was to try to free people's minds from the idea that we've only had one constitutional order since 1648. But many people have, have the view that the nation state begins with the Peace of Westphalia and it just continues up to the right moment. And if you have that picture in your mind, then when you see that state being eroded, you're, dread, you're, you're driven to one of two conclusions. Either that's not really happening, after all. If we, we've only had this kind of a state before, it will continue. These, these apparent threats are only apparent. Or if that's the only kind of state there is, then the state itself will wither away and, and vanish. But if you see that we have had a half dozen quite distinct constitutional orders, then you can say, well, perhaps we're on the verge of another. Nation states said, give us power and we will improve your material well-being. Franklin Roosevelt said that, but so did Joseph Stalin and so did Adolf Hitler. They had different ways of accomplishing it, but that was their claim for legitimacy. Just as in an earlier era, a leader might have said, give me power because my father had it, or give me power because I was born at a particular moment under a particular star. These states in this constitutional order said, give us power and we will use the power of the state to distribute uh, material goods. And so it brought the first mass education, the first mass franchise, but it also brought a total war because it was a war against the national people. And in many ways it was a great success. Uh, the distribution of material benefits on a more egalitarian basis than had been the case in earlier centuries is one of the great triumphs of the, of the nation state. The new form you were alluding to, the market state, which will come in different versions just as the nation state came in communist, fascist, and parliamentary versions. This, this new form says, give us power and we will maximize your opportunities. What you do with it is up to you. We are not going to assure an outcome. And you can see many elements of this already in no particular order of priority. When states sell state-owned enterprises and move to sovereign wealth funds, when we in our state and in many states around the world go from unemployment compensation to labor retraining, when we deregulate industry, or more importantly, when we deregulate women's reproduction, when we go from conscription of a mass army to a much smaller professional all-volunteer force, when we go from uh, defined benefits to defined contribution pension plans, when we outsource uh, uh, to private uh, contractors government activities, all of these are elements of a market state. Now, we're not there yet. We still live in industrial nation states, but, but that's the future, and you can see it in many states across the world. And, and what, what you will have as this uh, ideal type, in essence, puts its feet on the ground and, and evolves is ups and downs, because the, the immediate question that comes to mind, the book was written before the 2008 uh, economic collapse, where the, the, the market uh, came to be discredited. Right. Uh, uh, so how, do, how does that affect this evolutionary process? Well, I have a wonderful uh, a friend, uh, uh, professor of law at the European University who sent me a note and he said after this sort of market uh, earthquake and he said, well, so much for the market state. And I wrote him back and I said, on the contrary, I regard this as a validation of what I argued for because I said that one aspect of this would be that our increasing wealth would be inextricably linked with our increasing vulnerability. And it was our vulnerability while we were making enormous uh, wealth, advances in wealth that brought us, brought us low. I don't think of a market state as an ideal in the sense that it's one that we should uh, pursue uh, because it is uh, fairer or uh, uh, more just, more inspiring, uh, 
than, than a nation state. So in that sense, it's not a, an ideal. Rather but an I, ideal type. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. That's, I, know, yeah. I know that's what you meant. Yeah. Rather, it's, it, 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 is a, it is a type of the kinds of constraints you and I were talking about a few minutes ago. This is where we are going for many, many reasons. And the ethical problem for publics and leaders is within this constraint, how will we, how will we make our decisions? There were many people on the left, for example, after the uh, financial collapse who said, well, this proved we were right. We're going back to socialism. Didn't happen. There were socialist governments in many countries, and not one of them went back to state-owned enterprises and went back to the socialism of the 20th century. Interestingly enough, most people look at the, the changes going on globally at the end of the century and the beginning, and they say, well, that's it for the nation state. It, it, it's gone, and meaning that's it for the state. Mm -hmm. But but what, what you're suggesting in the book, you, you say that uh, in, in three things that I want you to discuss briefly. Uh, what you will see is centralized authority for government over a smaller domain. The role of the citizen will diminish. The citizen will become more a spectator. The welfare state will be greatly entrenched, but infrastructure, security, epidemiological surveillance, and environmental protection matters of general uh, uh, Welfare will increase. So, so the, the, it's an evolutionary process, yeah. which if we sort of know that that these are elements of the ideal type, actually they they help us kind of understand all the things that are going on. That's right. You you ought to be able to read uh, these books, and then pick up the New York Times, and just see things a little differently. Yeah. It it's uh, I sometimes. Uh, describe my work to my students who uh, ask questions just like yours as one overlay. You, you, have, a, you have a geographic uh, domain and you can take my overlay off the shelf and put it down and you can see the mountains and the valleys and the rivers. But you can take another overlay and, and see uh, the political system as it was in the 16th century or take another overlay out of it and see where the principal tourist spots are. I just, I just offer one, but it's one that I hope, organizes the terrain in a, in a helpful way. And by helpful, I mean in one that makes our moral and ethical and political choices more perspicuous, makes them more, brings them to greater clarity. Now, you, you served uh, in a number of in administrative uh, posts and in, in policy posts in uh, the State Department and, and in, in the White House and so on. and, and uh, in the book, you're, you're suggesting that this new world uh, requires uh, a new way of, for policymakers to think. And, and you, you're, you're saying that the, the notion of a grand strategy uh, is less feasible. And, and what, what you're really arguing for is that policymakers should be employing scenario building. I, explain that to us, yeah. because it, it, it's, it's uh, very important. And, and as I watch the news after reading your book, I'm, I'm struck by how many of the issues in this book are one after another in, in appearing on the nightly news as, yeah. as problems for the, the, the executive. Yeah. Strategic planning. Uh, which we don't do enough of in, in government, is the extrapolation from agreed upon data to some particular single linear point in the future. Uh, I drove here from Palo Alto, so I knew where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to Berkeley. I knew where I was coming from Palo Alto, and I charted, uh, with the help of a GPS system, uh, what seemed like the most efficient route to get there. That's strategic planning, and although it took me, I don't know, what, an hour or so to do, strategic plans are relatively short in their uh, scope, three years, five years, something like that. In a period of relative stability, like the period of the 1970s and, and early 80s, uh, 
strategic planning can be a very effective tool because we have a pretty good idea of what's happening to demographics, to energy prices, and so on. But then towards the end of the 70s, in 1979 it comes to mind, uh, you began to get shocks to that system and it began to be harder to predict exactly where a particular trajectory would go. Now I think we're in a period of great turbulence and the fact that planners did not predict the uh, Arab Spring, for example, or the financial collapse. Uh, and I don't mean that no one did. Uh, uh, Robert Schiller predicted the financial collapse, and I'm sure there were commentators, but they were very rare. Uh, and it was not an agreed upon uh, a future event. In a period like that, strategic planning is of much less use to you. Scenario planning creates a few narratives. I emphasize few. One or two, maybe three different stories, four at the very most, about what the future might look like. But it's not about the future. Strategic planning is about prediction. Scenario planning is not about prediction. Obviously, if you have four incompatible scenarios, one of them is likely to be right than another, but it doesn't help the, the planner because he's, you've given him more than one option. Scenario planning is about the present. It's about sensitizing decision makers to the long-term consequences of the things they do now. Because if they have in mind already two or three narratives of what the world might look like and how it might get there, then a decision that may even seem innocuous today will trigger something in their minds about its ultimate consequences. And I think we need to do much more of that. Now, the National Intelligence Council has done uh, some good work in, in scenarios. And I, uh, I, I hope that this is something that uh, the administration can be persuaded to uh, pursue. An important uh, idea in the book uh, is your emphasis on, uh, in, in, as we, we're transitioning, uh, a new focus on defense and on vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, to make us uh, agile, uh, but at the same time thoughtful about what we can do here uh, to uh, ensure ourselves against the threats that might be out there. That's right, Harry. Uh, we focus pretty much on what you might call the demand side of defense policy. Who are our enemies? What are their capabilities? What, what threats do we face? And that's, that's fine. But in a period in which uh, your adversaries are diffuse, in some cases they may be unpredictable, uh, you may not have a, a timely attribution of an attack. You, if there's a, a biological weapon used against us, we may not know if it was naturally occurring uh, or whether it was actually an attack. There may be weeks or months before we know the true source, as, we, as was the case with the anthrax attacks. In that kind of world, you need to pay much more attention to the supply side. What am I doing to protect myself, to make my computer systems more resilient and, and uh, more difficult to attack? What am I doing to make information flows uh, quicker and more reliable in the case of uh, an epidemic? You, you, you want to take those measures that are more in your own control and that don't depend upon locating and annihilating your attacker. You are raising important questions about the institutions that we have relied on in this era that's passing and their, uh, their viability. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Let's address that problem because, in a way, I think at one point you suggest that the the Centers for Disease Control are a kind of institutional uh, ideal type mm -hmm. uh, in other areas where uh, intelligence becomes important, the information flow about what's happening, and a, a, and a sense of, uh, well, how do we respond? It's going to be a different kind of a response than we were used to in the past. 
This raises so many issues, Harry. Uh, just to take one that might strike you as tangential, think about the uh, current uh, health care reform debate and its constitutionality. The main reason uh, people who become ill do not go to a doctor overwhelmingly is that they don't have insurance. But if people do not present themselves when they become sick, their illnesses can't be reported and aggregated in the case of an attack. It is absolutely essential that you be able to quickly collate these presentments to see what's happening in any particular area or even across a, a region in the case of an attack. And for that, you need to have people who voluntarily, on their own, present themselves to emergency rooms and physicians and, and clinics. But this c covers a, a wide sw swath of, of information. I'll give you another example. At a, in a time when people traveled by automobile or by rail, relatively modest distances, the uh, viruses and ba bacteriological diseases they brought with them had a similarly confined scope. But when someone can acquire smallpox in Croatia, uh, as happened, can get on an airplane, go to London, and walk through Heathrow for an hour, uh, reading the newspaper, all the people the infected person encounters will then get on airplanes and go around the world, spreading a virulent disease in a matter of hours, spreading it before it manifests itself in symptoms. I can't get on an airplane if I have well, not paid my visa bill, if I can't pay for my ticket. But I can get on an airplane with smallpox and nobody stops me. I think if I were to propose that uh, we have a little machine that you spit into and that reads your uh, uh, sputum, that the people in most countries would object violently to that because it's a matter of their own personal health. They don't think in terms of the duty they owe all the other people in that, uh, in that vessel. I'll give you another example. When a child is born in this country and most countries in the West, we take a, an imprint of their heel, uh, both, both, the heel of both feet, these tiny little baby feet, mm -hmm. as a way of identifying them. Why don't we take a DNA sample? Uh, I think it's because people regard that as highly uh, intrusive. And yet if you think about the role that DNA has played in exonerating innocent people, then you want to say, far from this being an infringement of our liberties, it promotes our liberties. Think about uh, camera coverage in public spaces. I, I live in the very center of London, just off Piccadilly, and there are uh, closed-circuit televisions, uh, monitors up and down the street and all over West, Western London. Many people object to these, and yet they have been used to clear suspects and also to find guilty persons. You know, in a way that enhances our liberties rather than than, than limits them. So, so it, what what you really it, it's a it's a complex argument because in a way you're saying that well the state's now goal is to get out of the way to to support opportunity and uh, on the one hand uh, and but on the other hand aspects of the freedom and liberty that. Uh, individuals enjoy under the market state uh, will have to be um, monitored, watched for the greater good. So, so the, interest, the interesting question is how do, you, how, how do you think we will over time educate citizens about these changes that uh, uh, you know, they're going to have to acquiesce in or at least participate in a vote on them right. uh, if we're going to preserve the, the, the liberal de democracy that has triumphed? I think that's the key question. I think that's the key question. Preserving a, a liberal democracy at a time when it is going to suffer uh, uh, unpredictable and sometimes extremely uh, dangerous threats.
not just from uh, a global terrorist networks, which, who are, which are by no means confined to radical Islam, but uh, epidemics, uh, climate change, uh, genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, AIDS, SARS, sensitizing our, our people to the task we need to undertake to protect the democracy. When most people seem to think that the threat to liberal democracy comes mainly from the government is a very, very difficult task and, uh, and one that won't necessarily make you popular among people you'd like to be popular with. Is this, uh, uh, this theory provide us with a context to uh, interpret uh, the actions of a president uh, on the cusp uh, of the movement from one world to the other, uh, that, that uh, I'm, I'm thinking of myself now, and so as I evaluate yeah. President Obama, for example, I come out of a, a liberal Texas tradition, you know, the, 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 the welfare state, uh, you know, all of the, the, the consolidation of the, of the New Deal and so on. Uh, but, uh, so I have a visceral response to some of the things that uh, the current president mm -hmm. does based on, you know, those beliefs that I was born with. But, but as I read your book and think about what's going on in the world, it, it gives me new insights to a president uh, our current president, uh, President Obama, who basically is intervening in Libya mm -hmm. uh, without uh, acquiescing in the War Powers yes. Act, uh, who is uh, increasing or consolidating the, the changes in privacy uh, and uh, surveillance yes. that was undertaken. So, so he, uh, a president who basically is not responding to the unemployment. You're, after reading your book, it, it's, I, have a, I have a greater sense of the dilemma that President Obama or any president would have in this current context. I think that's a very good reading, and, and it's one of the reasons why I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of uh, President Obama's, because it's not that he is retrenching government across all areas. It's that he is enlarging the authority of government for a few infrastructure areas, uh, health, uh, education, uh, the availability and access to electronic communications. The state has to guarantee the security and abundance of those assets so that people can be free to make choices. And I, I think secondly that uh, the president has tried to unite strategy and law in a way that the previous administration had, had separated. And I think that is a very a wise uh, thing to do at this time in our national life. In the 20th century, nation states wanted to separate strategy from law. They were, things were much more professionalized. We didn't want commissars in our armies. Uh, we didn't want uh, military people running our democracies. And I think this was, was a great success for, for the United States and our, our allies. But in the 21st century, every significant strategic step you take has to be m melded with law. If you act outside the law, you undermine your strategy because the rule of law is what you're really fighting for. And I think Obama has been, has been sensitive to this. You mentioned the Libyan uh, conflict, and I think it, it's important for at least two reasons. One is, when the Security Council acted to approve the attacks, it was the first time the UN Security Council had interpreted Chapter 7 to apply to a conflict that was entirely within the borders of a single state. It was solely because Gaddafi had attacked and threatened to attack his own people that he was thought to be a threat to international security. Now that is an, a, a great step forward. We did have the UN Security Council resolution after Kosovo that applied to a similar context, but it was a, an after-the-fact resolution. It did not authorize the use of force the way this resolution did. That's an, of immense importance, and it shows, I think, a president and a secretary of state, by the way, uh, who've been successful 
at bringing law to bear at the same time we, you bring force. Now, the War Powers Act is, uh, is a, uh, a more controversial uh, matter. There are some people, uh, such as myself, who teach constitutional law, who think the War Powers Act is unconstitutional and who have always felt this way. The White House uh, has taken a slightly different tack from its predecessors and has said simply that it doesn't apply to our participation in Libya because we don't have troops on the ground. We are, are not a major part of the uh, use of force there. We're in a more supporting intelligence uh, and logistical role. I don't know that Congress would find that persuasive. Um, but, but I do think that going to Congress for the reform of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, for the, uh, uh, the reintroduction of most of the provisions of the Patriot Act, I think these are the right thing for a president to do at the cusp, is just as you, as you uh, quite wisely put it, between this transition from industrial nation state to a sort of informational market state. Mm -hmm. Uh, you emphasized earlier the uh, importance of legitimacy as the new Constitution uh, falls into place through, through human decision-making. Uh, let's look at the Libya intervention in a wider context, uh, and, and I, I want to understand how you see the President's dilemma. So you, you, you have the, the Libya intervention but then you fail to do anything, at least up until this point, about Syria. The rationale that you gave for the Libyan intervention uh, has not provoked a similar reaction yet with regard to Syria. And uh, this raises the larger issue of a president caught in this cusp, yes. uh, essentially is uh, winds up just by the lack of understanding of the complexity of, of delegitimating mm -hmm. his efforts. Uh, uh, and uh, talk about that dilemma because it, it's well, you really, put, you, yeah. You, you really put your finger right on, the, right on the heart of the matter. It's not just a matter of success, it, it's a matter of legitimation. And if the president, who as we all know is a very articulate uh, man, if he can't articulate a reason why we go in one direction rather than another, why we intervene in one crisis but not in another, then he will, he will delegitimate his efforts. I think there are two points to be made. One is that just because you can't act everywhere doesn't mean you, sh you shouldn't act somewhere. In the case of Libya, we had an international coalition, the principal advocates of, of which were the British and the French, not, not the Americans. And we know that to fight wars against terror, not just against terrorists, but against terror, against despotic states that uh, turn the very advanced weapons of the 21st century against their own people, against states that uh, import weapons of mass destruction for the purpose of compellence rather than deterrence, we know that to defeat those states, we have to have partners. So one good reason to go into Libya rather than Syria is that the level of violence in Syria, in Syria hasn't reached the level that it was in, in Libya, and because we had partners who recognized that and who took the lead. It's also true that the Arab League condemned Gaddafi and appealed to NATO to intervene. That hasn't happened in, in uh, Syria. But sometimes my students and my colleagues will say, uh, they said this when we went into Iraq, there's so many dictators around the world, why pick this one? And people will say, well, it's because he has oil. Uh, and I, I think that's not an illegitimate concern. Saddam Hussein was especially dangerous because he was especially rich. He had the second largest proven oil reserves in the world. And so to remove him from power and not the generals in Myanmar, uh, is not, it, it's, it's neither unrealistic, nor is there anything particularly unethical about it. 
because you, you want your strategy to serve your values, and you can't do that if you're only intervening on uh, the grounds of, uh, of humane treatment. One final question. Uh, what, what idea uh, would you like to leave our audience with that comes out of this, uh, this uh, uh, the shield of Achilles? Uh, and in addition, is there any, the book was published a while back, is there any Thing about the book that you would change uh, uh, in, in light of uh, events that have happened since? No, I think that um, in, in The Shield of Achilles, I sort of threw my cap over the wall and made many quite specific uh, claims. And, and I think that, by and large, those claims have, uh, have been vindicated. Um, I think many of the things that happened, uh, that I thought would happen, have, have in fact happened. But if there were a message from that book, uh, it would be this poem by Xu Ting, a Chinese writer translated by Carolyn Kaiser called Perhaps. And if you don't mind, may I just read it? Please. These please. aren't my words, but, but, uh, but they're better expressed perhaps because of that. She says, perhaps these thoughts of ours will never find an audience. Perhaps the mistaken road will end in a mistake. Perhaps the lamps we light, one at a time, will be blown out one at a time. Perhaps the candles of our lives will gutter out without lighting a fire to warm us. Perhaps when all the tears have been shed, the earth will be more fertile. Perhaps when we sing praises to the sun, the sun will praise us in return. Perhaps these heavy burdens will strengthen our philosophy. Perhaps when we weep for those in misery, we must be silent about miseries of our own. Perhaps because of our irresistible sense of mission, we have no choice. Well, on that note, uh, Philip, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me show the audience uh, our book. Uh, the Shield uh, of Achilles, which uh, uh, still is definitely worth a read, uh, especially uh, in these times. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Harrison. It was a great pleasure to have you again. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.